deal until I Daniel chapter 3 Daniel chapter 3 we are progressing through the book of Daniel we are progressing through the book of Daniel we're now at Daniel chapter 3 beginning at verse 16 and we'll have uh, you have before you up to verse 24 I'm going to add one verse to that. And it reads just like this. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And he said... And his attitude toward them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing the robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Then the king, Nebuchadnezzar, leaped to his feet in amazement and ask his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw in the fiery furnace? They replied, certainly, your majesty. Verse 25. Look, he answered, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire. They are not hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the son of God. Amen. Do me a favor and just touch three people around you and just say the pact. The pact, the pact, the pact. God, afresh, we confess we need you to speak now. Speak so your people could hear. Whisper in our ears, touch our hearts, translate, interpret. We thank you in advance. Solo dia gloria. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'm certain you know the story being from New Jersey. But still... If you pause and thought about it, it might seem too good to be true. George, Sam, and Ramik, they were running through the halls of their schools in Newark. They were running through the halls in their school because they had a substitute, so they decided, we're going to skip class. Skipping class, as some young folk are off to do, running through the halls, security's coming after them. They knew, need to do something, so they decide they're going to hide out in the school library. But when they get into the school library, their plans are a little messed up, Minister Woods, because there's a teacher standing in front, and they're lecturing to a group of students about the medical field. And so at the end of the lecture, they made it safe they weren't caught. One woke up, and the other one named George said, Hey, Ram, why don't we agree to become doctors? He said, well, well, tell me what that means. He was asleep. He didn't hear the lectures. He said, it means we'll have to go to school for about eight years, but we'll get to help a whole lot of people, and we'll make a whole lot of money. Literally, in that moment, they started the pact. A true story from Newark. They had to endure living in the literally the peak of the crack epidemic. They didn't have male role models. They didn't have a lot of the resources that all of us think that we need to be successful. But they did it. They did it 
it largely because, and I'll start first, by the grace of God. Because God put people in their way. God turning their skipping class into going to a class that would educate them on becoming a doctor. Literally now, there are three doctors, medical doctors. There are teachers in colleges. They're doing great things. And the book is titled The Pact. But I believe there's some power in the notion of a pact. The truth is, whenever you agree with someone to do, to be, to go, to be something, that's a pact. But when the pact has great meaning and purpose, that pact is incredibly powerful. And the truth is, all of us in here today have at least four that I call the core. I'll slow down. We have at least four that I call the core. Think about it. Who are the four people who are speaking the most into your life? If you had to write their names down, could you do it right now? Who are the four people who are speaking the most into your life? It's argued that our president, his number one person who speaks into his life is Fox News. Amen. I don't know who it is for you, but all of us are influenced by somebody. They're speaking into your life. And the truth is, if they're broken and bitter, you too will be broken and bitter. The truth is, if they're angry, if they're miserable, if they're jealous, if they're hateful and spiteful, then you will discover that you are angry, that you are bitter, that you are yeah, hateful and spiteful. But if they are filled with the Spirit, if they're chasing after God, if they have a vision from God and for God, if they're passionate about the things of the Lord, if they believe on the name of the Lord, if they can get a prayer through, if they know Jesus is still the way and he's still the answer, if they know the Lord and they're centered on the Lord, then can I talk to you? Every now and then you'll get a blessing It'll be a secondary high. Amen. Yeah, yeah. Last week, Pastor Thorpe was preaching, and I couldn't help but think about that woman who went into that room to anoint Jesus with that alabaster box. And I know if you know anything about alabaster, that's a powerful and costly perfume. All you need is a little dab because a dab will do. All you need is a little bit, and it makes a major impact. But she didn't put a little bit on Jesus. She broke the jar and gave it to Jesus, all of it. But can I tell you something? everybody who was at the meal when they left that meal their friends were saying you know I can smell something on you and they had to say that's what Jesus got anointed can I talk to you who are you hanging around who are you spending time with who are you in the midst of is the anointing on their life flowing to your life is the stuff that they're working with working in and on you I hope so and I hope they're saved sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost that's for my mama right there all I'm trying to say is that you can make a pact with people in your life. And if you get the right people in your life, your life will be forever blessed and forever changed. If I had time, I'd tell you why I said the four core. Because there are three in this text at first, but then we meet the fourth. And I want to let you know, for every believer, we ought to have a fourth one on our side. We ought to have a fourth one on the inside, always speaking to us, talking to us, encouraging us, encouraging us and guiding us along the way. Let me show you in the text. Notice when we look at these three Hebrews, Hebrew boys that they are never mentioned independently that you never hear about Shadrach or a bad Negro. No, nowhere do you find any statement or any notion of them by themselves because they stuck together. And that's the first principle of a true pact. A true pact, you have to be available. Who are you available to? Who are you available for? And I got to pause and parenthetically pitch a point. Don't be available for everybody. I'll say it again. Don't be available for everybody. Somebody said it this way. I didn't say it. Forgive me. I'm just quoting. Don't talk, talk, don't talk to stupid people on your smartphone. Amen. You, you can't be available for everyone all the time. You have to determine who you will prioritize in your life. You cannot give this kind of availability to everybody in your life. You have to understand that there are certain people who will have a certain impact and who you can have a certain impact in your life. So you give your life to the right people at the right times in the right way. Who are the four core? I hope you're writing this down because I really want you to investigate, to examine your life and find out if you're giving yourself to the right people. 
Find out, okay, let me give you an illustration. Let me see if I can make this play, because some of y'all know I miss, and you might be offended. I don't want to offend you. Come on back. When I pastored in Charlottesville, my, 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 my office window uh, faced the back of the church. It was on the floor level, and literally uh, started off one time, then once a week. Literally every day, the same brother would come to me and talk to me about how he was still getting high, and I loved him. He was my friend, so I prayed with him and talked to him. Our conversations would sometimes last two hours, praying and talking to him. Now, let me explain. I've got a whole lot of challenges. I want you to know that. I've got a whole lot of issues. I want you to know that. I'm not trying to say I don't have issues because I got issues. But my issues don't deal with drugs or alcohol. And so finally, the custodian of the church, true story, the custodian of the church, and he's been here, came to me and said, look, Rev, you're wasting your time. You need for me to talk to him. I said, what? He said, look, I'm a recovering alcoholic. I'm recovering from drugs and addiction. I need to talk to him. You're wasting your time. I know how to talk them. They sat down and they fellowship and it forever changed his life and it changed my life. And look, in less than six months, we had a, a ministry called Narcotics Anonymous and there'd be 40 people meeting twice a week in one room, getting healthy and getting whole. You see, you are not assigned to everyone. Yeah, I, I said, yeah, you are not assigned to everyone. You are assigned to someone. If you find the right someones, then you will be a true blessing. You can give them your best. I know I'm in the Bible. In fact, it's in Mark chapter 2, Mark chapter 2, beginning at verse 2 to verse 4. It's a short pericope, but a powerful story. Look, it tells the story of one unnamed man. This unnamed man is paralyzed. He cannot walk. He cannot move. He's on a mat. He cannot help himself. But look, the Bible says there are four who carried him. I see it in my mind's imagination. There's one on each corner. They're helping him get to where he needs to get to. But when they get him to Jesus, because that's where he needs to get to, the crowd was too thick. The crowd was too big. It was a house party and it was really going on. Somebody was singing the, never mind. It was a house party and they couldn't get him to Jesus. And somebody said the roof, the roof. So they carried him to the roof. They dug a hole in the roof and they lowered the man to the roof. Why am I telling you that? Because look, I want you to know that not only do you have to be available, but this is going to hurt some of the brothers in the house. And I'm talking right here to brothers and all of us. You have to be vulnerable. Look, I told you, you got to help some folk and some folk have to help you. Can you look at the three Hebrew boys with me for a moment? And I want you to see the humanity in the history. If you knew you were getting ready to be thrown to a furnace, would you be at some point a little concerned? Would you be at some point a little troubled? Would you be at some point a little bothered? Please don't interrupt me with your television uh, theology and think, oh, no, because they saved, sanctified. They had no worries. At some point, Shadrach said to Meshach, I don't know about this. At some point, a bad Negro said, I'm concerned. I don't like barbecues when I'm on the menu. Look, at some point, they were trouble. And in your life, can I be honest with you? I don't know if you'll be honest with me, but are you ever troubled? Oh, I'm glad we got a few honest folk in the house because you can be a superman, but you're still a human. And at some point, sometimes you still trouble. You need somebody who can call you late at night. You need somebody who can stop by your house. You need somebody to say, brother, we've been here before. Sister, we've been here before. Look at the text. They were three brothers who stuck together through thick and thin. Can I talk to you for a minute and skip hop through the scriptures? You ever notice what friends Samson had around him? Think about it. Let it marinate. None. Yeah. But when people have people around them who are true friends, they can help you out in a hot spot. I read to you Psalm 46. Psalm 46 says, in times of trouble. In the Hebrew, that literally translates to a tight spot. All of us will be in a tight spot. All of us will be in a hard spot. All of us will need somebody to carry us. It might be for a week. It might be for a month. All of us will have a cross to bear. And sometimes bearing that cross will seem like it's breaking our back. We'll need somebody to come along and say, sister, it's going to be all right. Brother, you can make it. Don't listen to him. Don't listen to them. You're doing it. God's got you. We're going to make it. Come here. Can I talk to you for a moment? God told me to tell you, you can make it. God told me to tell you, you can take it. It's going to be all right. Let me go back to the text. These were three people. 
And one of the realities of being a person is you need people to encourage you. You need somebody to prop you up sometimes. You need somebody to help you out sometimes. And please don't do it just have one person. Mm -mm, mm -mm. Mm -mm, mm -mm. Can I talk to you? There's a little bit of psychology and counseling too. Uh, let, let me talk to you. Some of us want to rely on one person all the time. Can I tell you, that makes you a pain. That makes you a burden. Notice the text that I gave you, Mark chapter 2, there were four. When you put all your problems, all your burdens on one person, no matter who they is, they can't carry you. You got to have some, a, a, a group of people who can partner because one of them can't help you in one circumstance, but another one can help you in another circumstance. You need people. If I had time, I'd just pause here and have a prayer session and a conversation. Because too often we want to rely on one person. And when that one person needs help and we need help simultaneously, then we, ain't, we don't have anyone to go to. Forgive me. We don't have anyone to go to. You need people in your life. But not only do you need people in your life, you have to be first available. That means you're there for them. But then you have to be vulnerable. That means they're there for you. You got it? Available. Vulnerable, but look at the text. Not only were they available, and not only when they were vulnerable, when they were getting ready to go into this fiery furnace, when they had to face this hard difficulty, God was faithful, and God made sure that, look, they were durable. Because how did they get to the place where they were willing to stand strong? How did they get to the place where they didn't throw in the towel? Why didn't they run to another city? Because at that point, they had been encouraged by one another. They had been strengthened by one another. And they had become durable. Reverend, why are you using that word? Because I think it's a simple but powerful word. And I believe that too many of us as Christians, as people of faith today, have received what the world wants us to think about ourselves. And we've thrown in the towel. We've, th we've told ourselves, it's going to be easy. We've told told ourselves, I won't have enemies. We've told ourselves, everybody's going to be my friend. That's a lie. You're going to have hardships. You're going to have difficulty. It's going to hurt. You're going to take a hit. But God wants us to know by the power of the Holy Spirit and through the circle of people or the four core that he's put around us, we can handle any situation. You can bear it even though it's hard. You can make it even though it hurts. You can take it even though it's not easy. You are able but look, if you're truly going to be this, this, have this core of four, at some point you have to decide that you're going to be accountable. Right. Accountable means that you come into true agreement. That there are some things that you will not do. That you put your name on the line. The four guys who I told you about, uh, who grew up in Newark, they agreed that they all would apply to school. They agreed that they would do their homework together. They agreed that they would do summer jobs together. Two of them became incarcerated on the journey, but they still stuck together. They still kept pushing. They still, because they were accountable. Who are you accountable to in, in this life? Is there anybody who you're accountable to? Is there anybody who you truly committed to? Is there anybody who you said, I've got your back, I'm with you. Is anybody accountable to you? I love the silence. I hope you're thinking about it. There need to be some people who are accountable to you and some people who you are accountable. You don't want people around you who aren't at some level giving some accountability. Because if they're just giving lip service or they're just trying to hit you on the back of the head with a board, you don't want to hang out with them. And I really, I, I really should go on, but let, let me press my claim because some of us have this, this strange notion that we want support from the people who can't stand us. Why are you trying to get that man who can't be faithful to any man to be faithful to you? I'll just go on. Yeah. Um, and, and so here in the text, it comes to this, 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 this culminating point of being durable. And I've come by to tell you when you practice the, the, the truth and the principle of the pact, you will find that your life, you in your life, you will be durable. You'll be able to stand against the hardships of times. You'll be able to go through hardship. You'll be able to go through pain. You'll be able to go through hurt because you practice the principle of the pact. This is wonderful. And and I'm really preaching about favor because at the end of the day, I want to let you know when you are favored by God, there'll be some tests in your life. There'll be some hardships in your life. There'll be some hurts in your life. Pastor Thorpe, 
it won't always be easy. Everybody won't always be agreeing. There'll always be some times, there, there will be some times when you wonder how you're going to make it and how you can take it. I read the story last year of a young man named Walter Carr. Walter Carr was a college student who had just left the Marines. In the Marines, he had been toughened. He had been strengthened. He had been taught that things won't always be easy. He had been drilled. He had been pressed. He had gone through hurt and hardship. And look, one day he graduated from school and finished the Marine Corps and now he had to get to work. But look, his car didn't work. It was the day before he started his job, but his car didn't work. So he called this friend and that friend. He checked for buses and he checked for that, but there was no way that he could get to work. So he knew his job was 20 miles away. So look, at 7 p.m., he started walking to his job the next day. He walked literally for hours. He walked for hours, 20 miles. When he got to his job, his supervisor finally arrived and said, look, man, how long have you been here? He said, I've been here, I guess, an hour or so. I didn't know how long it'd take me because I had to walk 20 miles. Walter Carr explained, I wanted this job, and I knew I was strong enough to handle this job. I knew nobody could take it from me. This is my calling, and I could do this thing. I know that the Lord was going to help me. I know I had to walk in the dark, and I knew I had to walk in the car and the cold. I knew I had to walk by myself, but I was willing to do it. This is what he told his supervisor. His supervisor looked at him and said, you really walked 20 miles? He said, yes, I did. What you going to do tomorrow? If I got to walk 20 miles tomorrow, I'll walk 20 miles tomorrow. The word got around. The CEO of the corporation heard about this young man, said, I want to meet you. He heard that Walter Carr had to go through hardship, had to go through pain, had to go through difficulty. And he heard about his walk. He said, young man, I'm so impressed by you and your durability. I'm going to buy you a car. That very day, he got a new car. And I want to testify on his behalf. If he was here, he said, I'm favored. And I'm favored because my car didn't work. I'm favored because I had to walk. And I'm favored because I had to walk. I had a testimony of my walk. And when I testified about my walk, God blessed me not with another, not with just another car, but with a new car. I don't know what you're walking through, but if you got to walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I want you to fear no evil. I want you to know that God says that I'll be with you and I'll be for you. Just walk on when you're tired. Walk on when you don't feel like walking. Walk on. If you got to walk by yourself, walk on. And if you really get excited, get a pep in your step. And when they ask you where you're walking to, tell them you're walking to where God has sent you. Tell them you're walking to what God has gave you. But just walk with your head up. Walk with your shoulders back. Walk with a little swagger. And I promise you, at the end of the day, even your enemies will look up and say, I thought there was three in there, but I see another one. He looks like the Son of God. I see one who got power in his hand. I see one who can walk on water. I see one that called the earth into being, called the stars into being. They're still shining. They're still turning and they're still spinning. But keep on walking. Walk on. Walk on. Walk on. In the name of Jesus. The good news is you don't have to walk by yourself. You don't have to walk by yourself. Don't believe that lie. God has people. People who will walk with you. God has people who have walked the same journey that you've walked. God has people who will help you. I was, I was uh, t getting ready to do my intensive week where you go to class and you report all your assignments. And you have about 25 books that you have to read. And so I'd read about 15 of those 25 books. And so the dean called me and I just knew what the dean was going to say. He said, look, it's obvious from your report, you got to turn in five page papers, explain that you read the books and analyzing them and discussing them. Then you got to stand and report on them. And I did pretty good, I thought, but I didn't turn them on papers because I didn't read all the books. But about 10 hours short on. And so Dean called me and I knew I was in trouble. I knew I was in trouble. Dean said, I need to talk to you. I said, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I know I'm far behind. And, you know, I've been a little busy right now, but, but everything's going to be all right. Dean said, oh, no, 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 no. Why didn't you tell us you were having a baby? If you would have told us that you were having a baby, we would have not just held back some assignments. We would have re reduced some of your assignments. All of us have babies, too. We know what it's like. You just had to tell somebody. Yeah. 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 
we would have helped you. And finally, he gave me a sheet. He said, this is a sheet for scholarships. I want you to go home and fill this out. I believe that, that we can help you. All I'm trying to say is sometimes we're walking alone. You don't have to walk alone. God will put people with you, for you, and around you. God will put people with you, for you, and around you. You don't have to walk alone. We're standing to our feet. The gospel has been preached. One of the principles, the Greek is koinonia. We even get the word coin from it, but it means to have all things in common. Of being a Christian is God says, not only do you have me, but I've assigned people to you. I've assigned people to you. Sometimes they're there for a lifetime. Sometimes they're there for a season, but they're there to walk with you. So you don't have to walk alone. If you're here today and you feel like you're walking alone, I want to challenge you to search for, ask God and ask someone to partner with you in your journey. Now, if you're married, it should start with your spouse. Well, first start with the Holy Spirit, then your spouse. And then there should be two other people, godly people, who you can talk to. Now, if they're perfect people, if they're judgmental people, if all they can say is what you can't do, don't talk to them. Pray for them. Pray for them. Pray for them. Just, just say, God bless them. One day, maybe I'll be perfect too. But for the rest of us, find people who are compassionate, caring, careful, considerate. They'll talk with you, walk with you, and help you. I hope you hear me. Because God never told you to be isolated. As you care for your family member, as you work that difficult job, as you raise your children, God never told you to be by yourself. The doors of the church are open first for salvation. Salvation is a relationship with Jesus, who is the Christ, the Savior of the world, God the Son, the Son of God. If you're here today... I want to encourage you to connect with Jesus. There's no one more vulnerable, more honest and open than Jesus. You remember Jesus said, let this cup pass. He said, God, I don't want to do this. But then he said, you know what? Not your will, God, but my will. He's a picture to all of us of what it means to be human and a child of God. First for salvation. If you need to know Jesus, come right now. Jesus, the Savior of the world. Jesus, your Redeemer, the one who restores you. Jesus, you can come right now. Not only Jesus Christ, but you need a church family. If you're here today and you have not, you're not committed, connected, we want to encourage you. Praise God. We want to encourage you to connect with Shiloh. We want to encourage you, hallelujah, to connect, hallelujah, with Shiloh. Amen. Amen. We praise God for our brother who's coming. We praise God because he has the wisdom to consider us. Amen. First, for salvation. Second, for membership. If you're here today and you're not an active member, of this church or another. Maybe you've moved from another place. We want you to consider us. Come on, my brother. Amen. Salvation and membership. Are you here today? You don't have a church home? You've been visiting? You've been looking at churches? I want to challenge you, encourage you. It's a strange thing that for some reason it's difficult for us to take that step of faith. But that's what this is. This walk, this journey is always a step of faith. If you don't have a church home today, take that step of faith. If you're away from home and you need a church home in the meantime and between time, take that step of faith. If you've been fellowshipping with us, watching us, thank you for watching, but I want you to join us, to walk with us, to meet.